the afternoon and the morning. So how many of you in the room have had pituitary surgery? Okay, so lots of you. So you, 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 know, you know what it's like, potentially. I'm going to talk to you. This is going to be a sort of a general talk on, on the, the use of endoscopic uh, pituitary surgery. Um, and, and the objectives, I think, are to, for you to understand the indications, um, learn the goals of, of pituitary tumor removal, learn how the endoscope can help us in terms of visualization, and then appreciate some of the, the nuances, and then also realize the limitations and the potential complications of uh, endoscopic pituitary surgery. So you've seen probably quite a few slides about the anatomy, and I, I'd say by the afternoon, you probably all are, are experts on, on pituitary anatomy, um, no, noting that the pituitary gland is really um, surrounded by a lot of key structures, notably the carotid arteries, the nerves that, that move the eyeball and for facial sensation, um, and then also the optic uh, chiasm, which sits directly um, above the pituitary gland. Here's a, a side view showing how the carotid artery loops around on the outside of the gland here, provides its blood supply, um, but can be very, very close, and that's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to. When you have a tumor, um, the, uh, the gland, uh, these are MRIs looking straight on at the patient, so this is the right side and this is the left side. You can see the pituitary stalk, you can see the gland here in a little microadenoma, Neck, right next to the carotid artery. Those two dark circles are the carotid arteries. Um, this is the air in the sphenoid sinus. And here's a uh, somewhat bigger tumor, a macroadenoma, that's pushing the gland way over to the right side here, and the optic chiasm is lifted up. And then here's a very big macroadenoma where the gland is extremely thinned out, uh, and a very large tumor that's going out over part of the carotid artery here. That tumor, if you were to image it uh, right along here, you would have tumor out in this area behind the carotid artery. So the, the imaging uh, and understanding anatomy are obviously key, um, and we spend a lot of time looking at these images and trying to understand how the gland has been distorted. So there's obviously pituitary tumors are the most common tumor in the, in the neighborhood. Um, uh, but there's other things, Rathke's cleft cysts, which some of you may, may have had or have, where the gland is really surrounding this, in, this uh, cyst. Um, then there are craniopharyngiomas, which are benign tumors but very invasive and get stuck to all sorts of things. You know, the optic nerves, blood vessels, usually the gland is down here and the craniopharyngiomas go back towards the, the brain and the hypothalamus and they often push the optic chiasm uh, forward. And then there are meningiomas, which come from the, the coverings of the brain, and they often push, in this region, they can push the, the pituitary gland down. Uh, very common location. They often cause visual loss more than pituitary problems. And then there's some other tumors of the skull base. This is called a chordoma, uh, a more of a malignant tumor um, that often can get around and under the, um, the pituitary gland. So in terms of what our management opportunity or options are for pituitary uh, tumors, for the majority of them, it's transphenoidal surgery, as you know. Um, and we've really transitioned over to this endonasal endoscopic approach. We do use radiation for some uh, tumors, um, and we use medical therapy for many that we can't cure, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that. Um, but transphenoidal surgery is the mainstay for most pituitary tumors. Um, and there's many things that we see. So many people get MRIs for other reasons now, um, and they, you may find something, and there's many what we call incidentalomas, or small lesions in the pituitary that we just don't operate on. So if we look specifically at pituitary adenomas, um, as I said, for all of the major subtypes except prolactinomas, surgery is the mainstay. So if you have a prolactinoma, most of the time those patients are treated at least initially with bromocryptine or now cabergoline and has a very, very high success rate and safety profile. Um, but for all of these other things, including bleeding into the pituitary from a pituitary tumor, so-called pituitary apoplexy, the first line therapy we go to is surgery. So what are the goals? We want to selectively take the tumor out uh, we, to eliminate hypersecretion. So if you're making too much growth hormone, too much ACTH, too much prolactin, we make that normalize the rare 
thyroid stimulating hormone, same goal, get all the tumor out so that this hypersecretion syndrome goes away. We want to reduce mass effect, so the pressure on the optic nerves, um, we want that to go away. The pressure on the gland, we want that to go away. Um, and a lot of these uh, larger tumors cause headaches, and there's a pretty good rate of headache resolution by taking out large tumors. And of course, we want to preserve the gland function or improve it or restore it, and we can do that a fair amount of time. And obviously, we want to avoid complications. And what I like to say to you all, the patients, is we like to sneak in and sneak out uh, and not get caught. And uh, we try to do that all the time. And, and so I would say certainly over the, the history of pituitary surgery, which now has been around for uh, over 100 years, we've really come a long ways uh, with the, the use of, of the microscope. Dr. Uh, Hardy from Montreal was the first one to describe selectively removing a tumor and sparing the gland. Um, so that hasn't actually been around for that long. We started going just through the nose instead of the sublabial approach under the lip. Um, extended approaches are what we call where we go beyond the pituitary to, say, other, other tumors out, outside the realm of the gland. And then this realm of endoscopic surgery, which has been around now for, for over uh, 15 years, almost 20 years. The reason we switched to the endoscope is simply because we can see better. And this is a, a, a diagram, a cartoon showing the view you get with the operating microscope, which sits out the, outside the nose, and you get this beam of light through a speculum going down uh, to the cella where the, where the gland and the tumor is, and you get this very focused, very nice view right here, but you don't see a lot. With the endoscope, where you bring the scope in, into the uh, nasal cavity and then the sphenoid sinus, you get this very big, much more panoramic view. And so to do that, though, you need a team approach. And so someone has to drive the endoscope um, to provide the view, and then that allows the surgeon to operate. So this is Dr. Dr. Griffiths, my ENT partner, many of you know. Um, we have, so we have um, two monitors that we're looking at and our navigation in the middle. And the endoscope usually sits at the top of the, of the nostril, and the instruments are just underneath. Um, so this sense of teamwork is key, and we, we talked about this a little bit, a bit earlier today. And, and again, the, this multidisciplinary approach is, is really uh, essential. So for most um, patients, uh, pituitary adenoma surgery, it's three or four hours of surgery. It's, um, this is not considered not too much blood loss. Most people can handle this without an issue. We don't use nasal packing very often, although sometimes we do. We typically do some imaging and MRI often on day one. Sometimes we do a CAT scan uh, right after surgery. Most people are going home within two days of surgery, and now more and more days we're sending people home on day one. Um, and and that's, a, that's a nice thing for people to get out of the hospital quickly. We check up on electrolytes and their cortisol level uh, after that, and they come back and see us and see our ENT colleagues within the first 10 days. Um, they usually have an endocrine follow-up within about two to three weeks. Um, we say, as you've all heard, we, we don't like you to do strenuous activity for about a week. We, you can typically fly after seven to 10 days, and after three weeks you can do whatever you want. Anything goes. So um, here's the, um, the approach um, that we do now. It's a mucosal uh, sparing or pre uh, preserving approach where we make a wide opening into the sphenoid, the sphenoid bone here, and we make a wide bony opening of the cella here. This is showing the carotid arteries. We like to get right up to the edge of the carotids, um, and uh, that's really important for adequate exposure. So this is the initial approach, basically an incision in the mucosa that gets pushed down. We remove the bone here, then we remove the bone here, and that's our, our trajectory. Um, and this is really the, the beauty of the microscope, of the endoscope over the microscope. So this is the, an image looking in with the microscope. Um, there's a speculum down the nostril. Um, you can see some instruments here. That's the dura. Pretty good view right here. But when we look at the same structures with the endoscope in, we get this much more um, panoramic view. You can see out beyond the bone edges. We can see where the carotid arteries are living under the bone see where the optic nerves are, are hiding behind the bone. And this is really why we've switched over to this methodology of, of visualization. And so here's just this up-close view we get. Uh, this is just opening the dura of a very large tumor that's protruding out into the sphenoid sinus here um, and cutting away some of that involved dura there and then beginning the tumor removal. And you can see there's one instrument coming in from the left nostril, one coming in from the right. And the endoscope is held back here. 
um, giving us that, that beautiful view. So it, is, it does require some amount of teamwork and, and uh, maneuverability. And so really this approach now has become the ap approach for um, many of these midline skull-based tumors beyond the pituitary uh, adenomas. So for craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, chordomas, um, these are, this is really the way we, we go now. Um, but the question is, are we doing a better job? Are we getting more tumor out? Are we preserving the gland function more? Are we having fewer complications just because we're using the endoscope? And the answer is, uh, is a little complicated, and uh, I'll try and explain that to you. In terms of uh, complications, whether we go um, through, the, through a microscopic approach or an endoscopic approach, um, there's, there's many ways we can um, get into trouble and the way we want to stay out of trouble. So these are important factors. Are you operating on the right patients? Do you have the appropriate experience and in instrumentation? There's things that can go wrong uh, during the approach through the nose and into the sphenoid sinus. Obviously, working around the carotid artery is an important issue and something we, we uh, keep in mind every time. And then how do we take the tumor out and how do we work to preserve the, the gland and make sure that the gland works well? And then finally, our exit strategy. How do we get out? As you know, in many patients, we see some cerebral spinal fluid when we take the tumor out. And this has to be repaired. Otherwise, people can get uh, a, a postoperative spinal fluid leak. They can get meningitis and other problems associated with that. So there's a, there's a lot of potential things that can go wrong and have all been very uh, well documented in the literature. And, and um, I, I've certainly had every one of these complications. Um, and we, we learn from our, our errors and our mistakes and we're constantly trying to do better. Um, this is the use of the Doppler, where you can see here we're, we're listening for the carotid artery before we open the dura here. And uh, the Doppler is essential, uh, I think, for, for safe, wide exposure. And you can see here we're looking um, and really mapping out where it is so that when we open the dura, we know that we're not opening directly over the carotid artery. And so we do that on every case. And then this is what it looks like when we're actually in the view here. So we know that this whole area is the safe zone here. And if you don't know where it is, you tend to be more conservative. Uh, if you don't have the doctor, you're going to say, well, I'm not sure where it is. Let's make sure. So you might do a lesser exposure, and ultimately that may mean that you get less tumor out. So the use of the Doppler, I think, is, is very key. So let's look at some of the different tumor types. If we start with a non-functional or endocrine inactive tumors, um, uh, we do uh, quite well with those in, in most cases. So this is an endoscopic approach, removing this macro adenoma here. You can see the gland is thinned out. That white band is the gland. And right here we're seeing the gland, and we're pushing the gland up, and we're doing what's called a pseudocapsular dissection. There's a capsule of the tumor that's actually a rim of compressed normal gland. And we can use that to grab onto. It's, sometimes it's very soft and falls apart. But in a case like this, um, it's actually a great way to try and get the entire tumor out. So we're just gently pushing the tumor up, and then we're using an angled scope that's looking up more by 30 degrees. And we can see the top here. This is the gland. This is the tumor. And then in some of these cases, we can take the whole tumor out like this in one piece. Now, of course, they don't all come out that easily. <laughs> and that's the one I'm going to show you. Um, but. Um, that is the beauty of the endoscope. And we, this is a view you can't get with the microscope because the microscope comes in like this. It's, it's tunnel vision. Um, and so this is, again, the, the utility of the scope. Um, this is putting some fat in from the abdomen to help uh, prevent a spinal fluid leak. This is some synthetic collagen. Actually, it's not synthetic. It's bovine flexor tendon um, that we put in on every case. It's a scaffolding for, for scar tissue growth and, and then a a, um, a buttress, and this is an absorbable plate that we put in. Now more and more we actually use a bit of the posterior uh, nasal septal bone that we have to remove anyway um, for the exposure, and we, we use that. So we try to go on natural on this now. We don't like to use um, uh, things from, from elsewhere. So that's a typical removal of a macroadenoma, and you can see the result here. So the gland was pushed way up here like so, and now it's down here. This is actually the fat that we put in. You can see the gland is thicker, and you can see the pituitary stalk now is longer because the glands come down. 
Uh, and so the gland is much, much happier. Uh, here's uh, an invasive tumor. So the question is, because we can see so well with these angled endoscopes, can we get tumor out of the cavernous sinus here? And in fact, we can. We can get some of that tumor out. You can see here, this is a year after surgery. That tumor that was there is now appears to be gone, but we probably didn't get 100% of it. This is a non-functional tumor, so it's not uh, such a big deal, but this is someone we're going to have to watch for years because the tumor that's out here may definitely grow. When we looked at our experience over um, a long time doing it with the microscope and then putting the endoscope in, going as far as we could with the endoscope, uh, we looked at our results, 100, 140 patients. And what we found was that when we went as far as we could with the microscope in a, in a given case, and then in that same co case we put the endoscope in, we found in over a third of patients we, we were able to see additional tumor that we couldn't see with the microscope. And it was very size dependent. And you can see with the smaller tumors, it was only about 20%, but as you get to these bigger tumors, in over half the cases overall, we were seeing additional tumor that we couldn't see with the, the microscope. So that suggests that this enhanced visualization we get with the endoscope is really an important, important thing. Another paper that came out a few years ago showed similar things when they compared their microscopic experience to their endoscopic experience, and they basically showed an increased rate from 50% complete removal to 72% when they went from the microscope to using an endoscopic technique. But again, the difference was bigger um, with uh, larger tumors. So uh, we found similar things and others have found, found the same. Now we can't take all tumors out completely, the big tumors, there's some we just can't take out. Here's an example of a patient with a very large, what we would call a giant adenoma, over four centimeters in size. Um, it, this was a patient that I saw many years ago at UCLA. She just refused to have surgery. Um, she came back because the tumor kept growing, her vision was getting worse, and she eventually acquiesced and did the right thing. And as you can see here, um, we didn't get all the tumor out. We got probably about 90% uh, or 85% by volume, but we left this part around the carotid artery. And because we knew this was going to keep growing, she got stereotactic radiotherapy, which is fractionated radiation that she got over um, about 30 treatments over about six weeks. And she's now more than three years out, and the tumor is very stable in size. And, and that treatment has about a 95% or greater success rate. So it generally works extremely, um, extremely well for these tumors that we can't completely remove. And there's a fair amount of literature on giant pituitary adenomas, um, including uh, work from us here. And all of the studies show a similar thing. Um, these are all fairly recent papers. And they all show that the complete removal rate in general is, is uh, under 70%. So we're going to leave tumor around in a lot of these uh, patients and probably microscopic tumor in the majority. And so subtotal removal is, is probably the rule, not the exception. Um, and many of these patients will need additional treatment like radiation or medical therapy. And many of them will go on to develop uh, pituitary gland problems that uh, will require hormone replacement. So what about acromegaly? Well, <clears throat> there have been some recent studies comparing the endoscope to the microscope. And this is from the University of Virginia, where they have a very good pituitary program. Uh, that's where Ed Laws was, my, my mentor. Um, and uh, now John Jane Jr. and Ed Oldfield are there. They're uh, outstanding, very seasoned uh, pituitary surgeons. And they compared their two results together. Um, so they basically divided up with Dr. Jane doing the endoscopic approach. And Dr. Oldfield, who's a little bit older and old school, did the microscope. And um, all of the, the real advocates and fanatics about endoscopy would say, well, Dr. Jane's clearly going to do better. Well, the reality is he didn't do better. They basically did the same. Um, they had similar rates of complications and remission rates. So um, there was no evidence of increased tumor removal or remission in the patients, um, whether they were operated on endoscopically or microscopically. Um, so that's a very interesting thing, and it probably is because um, a lot of these tumors are invasive. They get out into areas where it's hard to see, and so you may lo it may look like the entire tumor was removed, but there's probably microscopic tumor, and unless you get 100% out, the patients don't go into complete remission. And so this is an interesting uh, study and an important study. What we can say, though, about surgery 
and acromegaly is that the more tumor you get out, the more likely someone is to respond to somatostatin analogs like octreotide or somatulene. I don't know how many of you are on these drugs, um, but these are the common drugs used to treat acromegaly. And this study clearly shows that <clears throat> if you can get at least 75% of the tumor out, that the patients are more likely to have a good response to these medications. So this combination therapy is an important uh, concept. Prolactinomas, as we said, most prolactinomas we don't operate on. They get treated with uh, cabergoline or docinex now. Um, and the reason being is because this is the typical response. Here's a patient who came in with visual loss from this large tumor and hypogonadism, meaning his testosterone was low. His prolactin level was over 8,000. The normal prolactin level is less than 20. So 8,000, that's pretty high. Um, very big tumor, over four centimeters. He had visual loss. Um, in, within two months of being on Dostinex, his tumor shrunk that much. So that's from January to March. And his prolactin level dropped by about 80%, more than 80%. Very impressive. We went up on his dose um, of Dostinex. And by November <clears throat> 2013, you can see the tumor is really almost gone. Um, so nothing to do with surgery here. Um, he still doesn't have a completely normal prolactin, but this is a very good response to uh, medication, and that's why we don't operate on a lot of these. Um, so what are the indications um, for prolactinoma? Um, ineffectiveness or intolerance of, of dopamine agonists, uh, microadenomas or a small non-invasive tumor, and some patients who just don't want to be on medical therapy. Some, some people say, I just don't want to take a medicine. If you have an 80% chance of getting the tumor out and me being off medication, let's go with that. Um, the occasional prolactinoma during pregnancy, um, these are known to get bigger during pregnancy, and so if we saw that, we would probably remove that. We've had to do that on occasion. And then someone with uh, bleeding into the tumor or rapid visual loss, those are patients in whom we will do surgery. So here's a patient that had a mixed tumor. You know, not all these tumors are completely straightforward. This is a patient who had high prolactin and high IGF-1, a combination, a, a co-secreting tumor of both prolactin and a growth hormone. Um, so a little bit of acromegaly, a little bit of prolactinoma. Um, but because of this, we figured that this patient would do better. This is a large tumor, also causing visual loss. We could immediately improve his vision with surgery. Um, and we could get the vast majority of the tumor out, probably not all of it, but it would likely make medical therapy better. These are just the rest of his hormones, showing his testosterone's low, his thyroid was low. Um, and here's the surgery. That's the Doppler. Um, this was a, a tumor that, as you can see, is quite soft and under a lot of pressure here. Um, very typical looking of a, of a growth hormone secreting tumor. Um, often sort of like... Um, like custard, I guess, would be one, one uh, texture you might think of. Um, and these soft tumors are, are nice to remove. This one didn't have a nice pseudocapsule. It just sort of spilled out, as you can see. And these can actually be more challenging because as you take the tumor out, this membrane here starts to come down because of the normal pressure of the brain. And we have to work around this sort of balloon of cerebral spinal fluid and make certain that we don't puncture it or put a hole in it and create a spinal fluid leak, which sometimes we do. But obviously, if we can avoid that, we want to. The normal gland is now way over here on the uh, left side. And we're working through all these folds to take the tumor out. Now we're working up in this part over here, where the tumor is a little bit more fibrous and rubbery. We're, we're listening for the carotid there with the Doppler. And just going as far as we can to try and get the maximum amount of tumor, knowing that we're probably not going to cure the patient with surgery. Um, but if we can take the pressure off the gland, take the pressure off the optic nerves, and get as much tumor out, good chance for gland recovery, for vision recovery, and uh, probably will respond better to medical therapy. And so that's the, that's the finished product there. And uh, he did do quite well. This is his immediate post-op scan. You can see we put a fat graft in there. You can see the gland over here. There's probably some residual tumor around the carotid here that we couldn't get out. Um, but on post-op day one, his prolactin dropped by more than 95%. So from 1,200 down to 53. He had a normal cortisol level. That means the gland is functioning well. So that's all good news. And here he is now 10 months out. 
and he's just on a very low dose of Dostonex or cabergoline, and his prolactin is normal at five. Uh, he's refusing testosterone therapy for some reason, um, and that's come up, but it's still low. Um, and his IGF-1, which was high, is right smack in the, in the normal range. And this is his scan here. So his gland is recovered, his vision is recovered, uh, and he's on a very low dose of medical therapy. And this is where this team, team effort with the endocrinologists um, and the neurosurgeons is, is so important. But if you look at the endoscopic data, and there's not a lot of it, um, basically um, patients with uh, uh, operate on fully endoscopically, we do very well with the microadenomas in achieving remission, 94%, but in the macroadenomas, only about 40% or less. So same as with the microscopic series. So you're not going to cure an invasive prolactinoma with, just because you're using the endoscope. And then finally, Cushing's disease. And I think the really important thing with Cushing's, um, I, I think you probably all know the, how it happens. The pituitary makes too much ACTH, causes excess cortisol, and you get these progressive changes of, of weight gain, often in the face, buffalo hump, um, stria or stretch marks. You can get hypertension, diabetes. Um, one of the big problems with Cushing's for us is have we really made the diagnosis? And this is where the endocrinologist comes in to really help us because it is a very hard diagnosis to make sometimes. If you look at the prevalence of Cushing's in some of these high-risk populations, um, you'd be surprised. But some people that are, happen to be heavy and have hypertension and diabetes think they may have Cushing's and potentially want to have Cushing's because it's very treatable. It'll make those things go away. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So in poorly controlled diabetics, um, 2 to 3% um, had Cushing's disease, okay? So that it does occur. 1% um, of patients with newly diagnosed diabetes had surgically proven Cushing's. Uh, almost 6% of, of obese sub subjects referred to an endocrine clinic with all of these things had Cushing's disease. Um, and then patients, older patients with osteoporosis and vertebral fractures, when they were done, when they were evaluated for secondary causes, 11% of them had Cushing's. So they are out there, but again, they're a minority. So we have to do these screening tests, very important that the endocrinologist really confirms the diagnosis. Um, and then, of course, surgery is the treatment of choice. Um, and it involves selectively removing the tumor. Sometimes we have to take out a portion of the gland. We have to explore the gland in many instances uh, because the majority of these tumors are small and about a third of them we can't see on an MRI. So we literally have to go through the gland and slice the gland like a loaf of bread um, to try and find uh, an adenoma. Um, Postoperatively, we typically don't give any steroids. We wanna see the cortisol levels coming down very fast and we, we monitor these things for the first 48 hours. Um, and these uh, patients, for those of you that have Cushing's, you know that if, if we're successful with your surgery, most people are on glucocorticoids or cortisol replacement for six months to a year. And if you don't require that early after surgery, it probably means we didn't get the whole tumor out um, and we, we, we have not achieved uh, a remission. So there's a long history of surgery uh, with Cushing's disease. This is Ed Laws here. Uh, who trained me. Um, it's been treated surgically for quite a few years. I'll just show you one case here um, of a patient. A man, the majority of patients uh, with Cushing's, 70 to 80 percent are women, um, but here's a man uh, with Cushing's has all of the typical hallmarks of high blood pressure, weight gain, fatigue, low libido. Um, he had a very small gland surrounded by the carotid arteries here and what looked like possibly a tumor right here, and this is where, in fact, we did find the tumor, and we're doing that pseudo-capsular dissection, separating it from the gland, um, but this was an invasive tumor growing into the surrounding structures, growing into the dura here, and into this area called the cavernous sinus, and so we, we did have to do a little bit more work here in getting this tumor out completely. We had to remove some of the dura, we had to, um, cauterize some of the dura, we pour hydrogen peroxide on it, we do everything we can to beat it up so that all the tumor cells die or go away. And um, this is really what, what needs to be done. We, we have to take a fairly aggressive approach. Um, and then you get this clean looking dura here, but we still uh, like to cauterize that to kill any microscopic cells. And he, he went on to do quite well. His cortisol level dropped to less than one on the first day after surgery. 
And 32 months out, um, he's still um, in remission. And there's the hydrogen peroxide going in, straight out of the bottle. <laughs> Cheap, and it works, hopefully it, it helps. But again, if you look at the endoscopic literature, this is a paper that came out of Europe. Um, they had a remission rate overall of 72%, and that's right in line with what you get with the microscopic approach. Um, and, and again, in patients with invasive tumors, only 40% of those went into remission. So um, the endoscope is good, but it's probably not any better than uh, the microscopic approach for this particular disease. This is what we like to see before and after surgery here, um, this, this sort of nice, nice recovery. So finally, on the issue of pituitary gland preservation uh, and recovery of gland function, again, we make a big point of this. Um, we, we like to preserve the master gland. Obviously, it does so many things. And here, here it is looking very pale from a very large tumor. That's the tumor there. That's the gland. And after we take the tumor out, the gland gets its blood supply back. And in many instances, we can improve gland function. And here is a gland that's very stretched out. And here it is uh, thickened up, but down. it's moved down. But these glands can often, often recover. So we make a lot of effort to identify where it is in relation to the tumor before the surgery um, and make sure that we do everything we can to, to not harm the gland. Um, in some instances, um, this big descent of the gland life, so if we remove a large tumor like this, the gland is up here. It's going to come all the way down here after we take the tumor out. And you can see that here. And that sort of stretching probably results uh, in the development of some new pituitary gland uh, failure. And this is a case in which the patient uh, lost uh, their, all their pituitary function, even though it looks like the, the pituitary stalk is still connected. Um, the gland just did not sustain that amount of manipulation. And so it turns out that by far the most important predictor of, of, gland, re, uh, of gland loss is the size of the tumor. So for tumors under 20 millimeters or 2 centimeters, the rate of new gland uh, failure is around 1% to 2%. It's very low. And as you get to the bigger tumors, it goes up significantly to about 15% um, for the large, the giant adenomas. Overall, the risk is about 5%. So we don't do perfect, uh, but uh, in most instances, we spare the gland function. And so, um, and then this is just a final case. This is a chordoma, a skull-based tumor, where the gland is, is sort of riding the tumor here. And normally the gland would be down here. You can see this very enormous tumor here pushing the gland up. This woman presented with visual loss and she had amenorrhea. She lost her menstrual periods because the gland is distorted. And so obviously we want to preserve the gland here um, and get as much of the tumor out. <clears throat> and you can see here after the surgery on post-op day one, the gland is down. All of this is actually the flap when we do these extended approaches, we have to use some of the uh, nasal septal mucosa to reconstruct the skull base. But you can see here her gland is, is enhancing normally. It's looking pretty healthy. And then if we go uh, here to three months, uh, the gland looks very normal here. Um, and she went on to get what's called proton beam uh, radiotherapy, which is what we use for these tumors. Um, and right now she's got normal menstrual periods, normal vision. Uh, and resolution of her headaches, <clears throat> but we'll have, because she's gotten the radiation, we're going to have to watch that uh, as a potential source of loss of gland function in the years to come. And there's probably at least a 50% chance within five years she'll lose gland function. So these are just some slides on the, on the outcome. So in general, the remission rates um, uh, for the functional tumors is around 60 to 80%, depending upon the, the series that you read. For the invasive tumors, the numbers go below 50%. For the non-invasive, the results are probably higher than 90%. Um, and then again, similarly with the non-functional tumors, it really depends on how big they are and if they're invasive or not. We do very well with resolution of visual deficits. About 80% of the time, people's vision will recover. The pituitary gland uh, failure will recover in 25 to 50% of patients. And we do also very well with, with headache resolution for the big tumors. Fortunately, the, the rates of major complications are very low. And if you look at a bunch of series across the literature, it should be less than 1% for all of these uh, terrible things. Um, new pituitary failure, as I said, is about 5%. So overall, it's a, it's a pretty safe approach in experienced hands, whether you do it um, with a microscope or an endoscope. So I think in conclusion, for, for those of you, um, and many of you already had your surgery, but you need to make sure, do you really need surgery? Um, and 
<clears throat> you, you need to determine that from, from the experts. You need to find an experienced team of, of uh, pituitary doctors. Um, I think in terms of the approach, it's certainly becoming, the endoscopic approach is becoming the method of choice, and we have completely switched over, and I don't think we'll ever go back to the microscope, although it still is a reasonable approach. Um, the resection rates for large tumors and other paracellar tumors like craniopharyngiomas are probably superior to the microscopic approach, um, but for the functional tumors like acromegaly and Cushing's, they seem to be equivalent, and we don't see that the endoscope is really making a huge difference in remission rates. And probably the histology or the pathology of the tumor, the anatomy of the tumor, and the experience of the team are as important or more important than whether you use the microscope or the endoscope. Again, I would just stress this uh, collaboration between the team members is really key. Thank you very much.